So I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, Kelly Peterson from Bayfield County uh, Extension Community Development. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this response that we've been working on for the last few years, which has taken the form of a regional housing coalition. Um, I was listening to NVR the other day, or I was listening to a, a New York Times podcast, and they were talking about the pandemic and like, you know, where are we at the pandemic? It was a road trip from California to New York. And the, the guest was like, probably Kansas. And that was really a sad thing to hear, actually. But I feel like when I think about this, where are we in this response if this was a road trip from California to New York? And maybe best case Kansas, right? We are so in the middle of something that's clearly multi years in. So I'll be excited to give this in four years and see where we actually got to. Um, that being said, uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about how we ended up involved in housing, um, about this coalition and what we've been kind of working on. And then the other thing I was trying to consider just as we, as we look at what we want to do collectively around housing study group and where we're trying to take this is what might be useful for an extension educator just coming in and wanting to work on housing, what would you want to know? Because there were certainly some things that I've been, um, you know, like if only I knew back then what I know now, those kind of pieces. So I, just kind of keeping a list of those. Um, so Shawamigan Bay region named for the Shawamigan Bay, which is a nice little bay off of Lake Superior, a uh, little bit shallow, rich in fishing, Apostle Island. So this is this two county area up north, uh, Bayfield and Ashland County. I work for Bayfield County, but uh, because of the close, the proximity of the, uh, of the, the sort of population centers that are wrapped around the Schwamigan Bay area. Um, often, you know, we end up working collectively on things. So um, I've been doing a lot of housing work in both counties, but primarily in Bayfield County. Things to just know, right? When we talk about rural, we mean rural, right? Capital R rural. So about 16,000 people in Bayfield County increasing. This is phenomenal, right? When we talked about um, who, uh, who wants to, to, what developer wants to bet on a county that's going downhill, right? So this is really exciting that the 2020 census came out and said, you're growing, right? That, because that's anecdotally what people were living there saying is, I think we're getting bigger. Sure feels like people are moving in. A lot of people are moving in, but our projections are still putting us at declining. So that's a big deal. Um, you know, something to note in this, when this kind of rural as well, thinking about these tiny populations, right? So in the bottom of the 10 counties in terms of size of population, but in the top of, of a geographic area. And so what that looks like when you think about service delivery, when you think about um, you know, collaborating, all of those pieces that are really important when we think about this type of rural. And so Ashland County, a, a little bit different, right? Uh, there's a lot of ways in which these two counties are not similar. <laughs> and uh, as we move forward in, in this coalition, working together on a lot of things, um, there's some ways in which um, we are hamstrung by working together and some ways in which it's richer, which is really a part of any collaboration. Uh, but you can kind of see again, this declining population, but still this kind of larger county, smaller population, uh, not a big geographic center where there's a lot of people at any one spot. Uh, the other really important thing to know is that we're home to uh, two Native nations in this area, right? So Bad River Band and the Red Cliff Band. Um, and so all of the, the counties are in ceded territory. Um, let's see, growing population, we talked about that. 8% um, is a lot, that's a good amount of growth. That's not, that's not uh, nothing to scoff at for a, a rural area. I'm gonna skip through, I'm gonna skip through a bunch of these because I wasn't sure where our conversation would take us today. Um, this is another piece that uh, when I talk about our counties that in, inside and outside of our county, this idea of, of aging population. So Bayfield County is slated to be the eldest county in Wisconsin by 2040. Um, so the most people over 65 per capita. That is exceptional ramifications when we think about um, more people out of the workforce than in. What do those folks need? Especially when you throw it across this huge geographic area where transportation is a massive issue, um, where, uh, you know, this kind of workforce, you know, when you need to meet your your needs, uh, rural communities are often set up, right? You don't have a grocery store, but we have a grocery store, right? You don't have a, a school, but we have a school. You don't have a hospital, but this county has a hospital. So when you start to add transportation and really needing to meet those needs closer to home, uh, it starts to get real tricky. So important things when we look at this, and then of course the implications on housing. Um, and also, but this idea of this narrative, right, that we're losing young people, and that's a narrative that uh, folks in the community are really working to fight. It's not that we're losing young people, it's that people want to retire here, right? This is a, a very popular tourism destination, 
um, which definitely certainly has massive implications around housing as well. Um, so Bayfield County, um, you know, we have this kind of maturing to tourism economy. It's very amenity rich, which we're seeing now as people want to live in amenity rich places. Um, it's a very desirable people place to re relocate. So before it was a place where people maybe had vacation homes as well as our resident community, but those vacation homes are turning uh, certainly into uh, more full-time homes and, and almost a wholesale switchover. And so as people, you know, before our retirement age is lowering, um, and we're also seeing people that are maybe later in their career that have established um, a comfortable enough employment base where they really can telecommute now. And so that influx of folks um, that used to just come in vacation and are now really setting up shop for some amount of the year has certainly changed the game because a lot of those folks are coming from a much wealthier um, home buying and home selling environment. So when you sell your home in Minneapolis for you know, 400 to $600,000, uh, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar uh, home in Bayfield County looks fantastic, right? But um, already that is, is is pretty far out of what's affordable for folks that are working locally. Uh, income, uh, just throw this in there. So, state of Wisconsin, sixty three thousand median income for Bayfield County. Uh, not too far behind Ashland County, a little bit further. One of the things that we've been really doing in our communities as we've been talking about housing is letting go of the words affordable, low income. Um, you know, all, all of those people uh, of, of workforce, some of these euphemisms that have been created that mean nothing. We've really been talking about, let's just be clear what income bracket we're talking about. And then starting to help people connect what that means. If you work at the school district, where's your income fall, right? Who are, who is at 80% of median income? Who is at 120%? What services do we have already and where do they serve? Which income bracket do they serve? And that's really helped our conversations in our communities get a lot more specific and a lot less charged, right? Because we're starting to just talk about kind of real numbers as opposed to these words that are, are loaded in a lot of ways. Um, I threw this up there too, politics. I was, I was hedging on putting this in, but I realized, you know, as national politics has really, infiltrated lower uh, units of government in a way that's uh, we're finding now in housing meetings. It's really about talking points that have nothing to do with actual community and everything to do with where you might be on the, the political spectrum. And so that's been a really fascinating shift, even in the couple years that we've been working is, is where people are getting their talking points and, and whether those are real connected to what's actually happening in the community or not. So it is important to note. Um, Let's see, so about the, so this coalition that we started um, about September, 2018, uh, we started to get together with a few um, elected officials. So mayors of some of our small local towns and just started talking. Um, and that conversation just expanded very quickly, right? There was, um, because we have these multiple layers of government, but no one really had any dedicated housing staff. Uh, the tribal entities certainly have dedicated housing staff and we have a county, county housing authority, but they're very focused in a lane of um, maintaining housing programs that have very specific funding. So there isn't a lot of capacity to go beyond that um, in, in some respects. And so, um, but really those beginning conversations were just trying to get a handle. As we all know, when you start talking about housing, it can easily evolve into a conversation about 24 different octopus arms of things that genuinely affect it, right? So this very systemic issue. Um, and that was one of the challenges, right? Local officials were like, I don't know anything about this, but I have lots of people coming and saying, what is the town gonna do? What's the city gonna do? What are you doing at this nonprofit to help? And so um, at the beginning, it was just really trying to focus on needs and understanding these challenges and, and really get a handle on what housing even means. Um, <laughs> So I just put this in there to kind of uh, note some of the uh, things that we were really dealing with. Um, you know, just a lot of anecdotal evidence, it's a lot of uh, elected officials saying, this is what people are telling me. I don't know how to truth this out in the real world. I don't know where to look. How do I tell if, how do I know if this is actually a problem or if this is just three or four people that are being particularly loud in our community, right? So just a lot of lack of local data. Um, in rural communities, in the rural community that I live in, people just don't trust data because they can't see themselves in it, right? When we talk about anything national, even anything state of Wisconsin, even when sometimes people say rural, but it's a much larger context, people just don't see themselves in the data. And so there was really this trying to understand, does this even relate to us? Um, challenges for employers, recruiting new employees, so that, that connection there to the workforce. Um, how does housing get developed? 
who are developers? Do we have developers in our community? Do we have developers that know how to work with uh, affordable tax credits? Like what, how does this look? So um, just seeing this kind of strong lack of understanding um, who are our agencies that are you know, supposed to be helping us? How do we connect to them? Um, this uh, third one down, overburdened municipal resources. So again, you know, a town of uh, eight, 900 people, they don't have, there's, you know, everybody's a volunteer except for maybe the clerk that gets paid a little bit on the side. There is no resources to address housing. And so, um, but there is an expectation <laughs> that they address housing. And so really seeing these overburdened resources, trying to figure out like, how do we even juggle this animal? Um, and then of course, second homes, uh, this was, you know, 2018 is kind of the second wave of blow up of Airbnb and VRBO and those kind of democratizing um, the capacity to rent out housing. So that was certainly having an effect though we weren't totally clear what kind of an effect. Um, and then also some uh, some failures, right? There were some early failures that happened in uh, some of our communities where there was attempts and, and really failing uh, in some ways on just lack of understanding the issue. Um, who is this developer from where and why did they come here? We don't know if we trust them, right? Even if we have a housing issue, we're not sure if we trust them. Um, and no one really to bridge that gap. That wasn't a gap that the developer was able to bridge and it wasn't a, uh, there wasn't anyone standing in that. So, um, so that's kind of where we ended up. Uh, so I ended up um, ultimately being a convener of this regional housing coalition. So I provide um, the convening and the backbone support to keep us moving and rolling. Um, so elected officials, tribal, state and local agencies. Um, so throughout 2019, we met, you know, very regularly um, a lot of it was updates, a lot of it was pulling guests in from other areas in Wisconsin that were maybe having some success. You know, Barron County was having some early successes. We wanted to talk to them, um, really developing relationships with our state agency folks. So WIDA was, has been a really important one um, in trying to figure out like, what, can, what else can you bring to us? Um, and then also just continuing to define needs. You know, here's this huge needs. Of all the needs, where do we think this group's best lane is? You know, is it um, is it in a homeless shelter? Is that where we want to put stock in, or you know, or is it a is it services that we want to deal with? Um, you know, folks that might need more access to um, funds to uh, put a new roof on, or is it in this? And so, you know, there was a huge piece, and really, what they decided was they wanted to try and figure out how to have um, um, development of side that could move the needle on our housing issue. Right? This is what they felt like. This uh, this coalition of government resources really should focus on. So that's sort of where it's been. Um, I'm not gonna go deep through here, but in the plan of work for 2019, that was really reflective of what this group wanted to go on was really this interest in innovation. What are other rural communities doing? Where can we find it? How are they doing it? If they're not doing it, who can we talk to and start to invent things? Um, what do we need to invent to make this work? How do we invent the funding that we need? How do we find the funding we need to fill that gap so that we can create um, some development with an heir to affordability that our uh, resident uh, workers and employees can take advantage of? Um, and so I think in the interest of time, we'll just walk through there. Um, another piece that we started to do, which has been really helpful was the WIDA QAP. So, uh, the way WIDA um, disperses uh, tax credits for the um, low income uh, tax credit housing project process, we realized was just really dis disadvantageous towards rural communities. And so there was, uh, you know, this group really started to recognize that we had issues and some of them we might be able to deal with and some of them were going to require some advocacy. And so really um, this group starting to figure out where they needed to advocate at the state level to, to, to express their needs, to be seen as um, as worthy of, of support, of engagement from, uh, from state level resources. Um, and so one of those was, was commenting on, on those. So just kind of starting to look at some of the structural issues that were impacting the ways that local folks could move around and address housing. Um, let's see, so end of 2019. So in general, this group was really gaining a lot of momentum. It was just starting to be really clear that there was a lot of interest in collaboration, right? There was seeing, um, um, oh, there was a lot of interest in looking at scattered site development. We'd been sort of put, uh, sent down that path and there was a lot of interest in figuring out, is there a way that because no small rural community can take 60 units of housing um, and that's what the developers are telling us they're gonna need to do to be able to make this work, to make this uh, situation pencil, to be able to get the tax credits that they need, right? So is there a way that we can get 20 units here and 15 units here and 30 units here and 10 units here and start to move the needle across this region? Um, 
I was really happy when uh, our housing, uh, we just pulled in um, uh, Tom Landgraf is now one of the consultants that's been working with our housing authority. And he came in talking about scattered site development. It was like, hallelujah, here's someone that wants to try and move things in this needle, even though it's really, or move things in this direction, even though it's really challenging. Um, let's see. So let's see, uh, in February 2020, this group, uh, so these municipalities that we've been convening with and working with, uh, got some grant money to finally do a housing study. There was a lot of people came in presenting a lot of data and there was still a lot of questions. People were very concerned at the beginning. We don't just wanna do a study because we want more data. We wanna know what questions we have and we wanna see if we can get them answered. So this was a big process for folks to finally say, yeah, we still can't find the questions that we need. Part of it was um, in the level of data that we were looking at. Um, and part of it was what communities felt like they needed to make a compelling case for development to people internally in their community and also to people outside to bring in what they needed. And so it was sort of undertaken with this idea that like, we still have questions we can't seem to find answers to. Where do we do that? Of course, the pandemic um, it took two years to finish this whole study thing off. Wasn't great for momentum. I will say though that everyone really hung in there. Um, but these last few months uh, for me have really been about disseminating all this information from these studies, which has been worth its weight in gold, honestly, to, to reconnect with these communities um, at, at more of a town and municipal and community level meetings and sort of bringing back the data that they asked for, right? These questions and really, uh, again, move towards this new jumping off point of conversation. Uh, pandemic pause, let's see. Ah, the other thing is uh, WIDA. So we've been bugging WIDA for a while. What are the tools for rural folks? What are the tools that we can do to develop workforce and affordable housing? We're not finding them. Um, they don't seem accessible. Developers are telling us that it's not really working. What do we do? And so one of the things that WIDA did was they put together this program called the Rural, rural Affordable Workforce Housing Initiative with this idea that they were gonna select pilot communities in Wisconsin and they're gonna develop new tools for rural that could be employed across the state, right? So we said, we want in on that. Um, and so we submitted our application and were selected for that, um, which uh, is just literally started in March. So that was another, you know, almost two year kind of process of, they've been working through Door County, Marinette, um, still not quite sure what the implementation plans in those communities are looking like. Uh, a lot of conversation with both of those. So again, that one's kind of unfolding. Uh, but what was great about that was when that application came in, it was like, we have a, a, a 14 member committee that's well positioned across all these levels of government and nonprofit agencies all ready to work together. It was a very simple way to put together an application um, just to be able to demonstrate like we already have this coalition. So it was nice to be able to respond to that opportunity very quickly. Um, let's see, I'm gonna, so there's a bunch of stuff about our housing study in here. There's some slides that go with me to other communities. I think I've done 15 right now presentations in our communities of these, uh, of these member communities that have uh, financially contributed to the study. And so it's again, going back and sharing data. I don't really wanna tell you more about our county necessarily, but I wanna just highlight a couple of things that we've been noticing have been really aha moments for folks, great jumping off points in the data. So I'm not necessarily sharing this to give you a further picture of Bayfield County, but rather um, some things that have been interesting to share with people and what have sort of jogged, uh, jogged their interest. Uh, let's see, so those are all of our, so you can see town, right, financial comp contributors to these studies, towns, cities, um, counties, kind of a little broad mix of, of agencies that were represented. Oh, we did, so we did kind of took this two-pronged approach, right? We did a kind of a more formal housing report and then a survey. So the survey was really this idea of focusing on community level data, um, working to, we had a coalition of this, uh, members of the coalition work together to really craft the survey questions. Then we worked with UW River Falls Survey Center to make sure that this was sensible the way that we were asking. Kristen, of course, Kristen Rungi uh, was helping us too to figure out like, I kind of want it to go like this. Is this actionable data? Are we asking this in the right way? Um, but the idea was something that was very personal. Um, and really the goal was that, so our community could see themselves in the data. It's not just that we wanted to know what was happening in Northern Wisconsin. We wanted to know what's happening in the city of Bayfield, in the county of Bayfield, uh, in Northern Wisconsin, right? So trying to understand that. So we worked with them to make sure that we could disaggregate all of our results by town, that we were taking statistically relevant samples in each town so that we could make some assumptions about each community 
and that that would be um, something that we could hang our hats on a little bit, especially because a lot of what we were asking was uh, needs, opinions, attitudes, those kind of pieces. Um, <laughs> Let's see. And then the study was more of the traditional data, right? Like we also know that we want to be able to tell developers like what our vacancy rate is. And maybe you can dig into vacancy rate too and help us understand why it doesn't make a lot of sense in our county. We have so many second homes, right? Which skew your vacancy rate in a way that I still don't totally understand, <laughs> but they make it very difficult and make that a very strange number to, to impact. So we asked um, uh, the folks that did our housing study to try and contextualize some of that in a way that would be useful. Um, let's see, whenever I go into communities, this has been a couple of things I've been finding that have been really helpful in talking is to just sort of try and get everybody, not on this, not only on the same page, but on the same side of the page, right? So um, it's a national crisis, right? Wisconsin in the list of states is doing not as well as some other states. Housing is more difficult to develop in rural other areas. We don't have that economy of scale. Um, this is new burdens for your town government, right? So trying to share some context so that people feel like it's not from whoever, you know, Joe Schmo, who was the town chair before you, it's not her fault. It's not their fault, right? It's, it's the confluence of a lot of demographics and a lot of trends that are happening all at once that are really affecting what's happening in our community now. Um, this is a big wicked problem, like not shying away from this. This will make your head spin, right? <laughs> right? There's so many ways. Um, and we have to understand that there's no one right answer. The answer for your town might be different than the answer this town. And there might be need to be 10 answers ultimately, and they're going to take time. So just really setting people up to say, we all wanna be on the same team, right? There's gonna be a lot of ways we can get there. It's gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna be a little tricky. Um, also bringing into this whole economic development piece, that's been a real winner, right? When we just say, you know, that the economic development uh, conversations in our years, even in our area, even six, eight years ago, were jobs, jobs, jobs. And that has switched so dramatically to housing, 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 right? It's all the workers that are saying, I can't, I, I have to close my business two days a week because I don't have employees. You know, I can't, here's this list of 14 career type jobs at the county that no one will fill. Here's a list, the same list at the tribal government. Here's the same list at the hospital. Like we, we do not have the housing. You know, we keep hiring these people. We go through these exhaustive, these exhaustive processes and then they can't find housing and they have to give up the job. You know, so that has been reoccurring enough that that's really come full circle and people are really responsive to that. Um, also, just this idea that affordability, we has to be a conversation we have. If you're not talking about affordability when you're talking about housing, you're probably having the wrong conversation. And so really bringing that in. Um, and then just talking slightly about NIMBYism, it comes up in so many ways that um, I like to at least nod to it when I go into communities. Um, I'm going to see. This is a great one. This one always gets folks, right? When we think about what sort of a robust uh, sort of a, an area where you'd have robust enough rental situation that people could move in and out. We'd see that churn, that dynamism that we'd want in a housing market um, and that we just don't see that, right? We're not there. And so a, a lot of the data sometimes that I print is just confirming people's suspicion and that goes a long way. Um, this one really strikes me. So this is just about our county, but we only had a net of 11 rental units, right? So you can think about a population that grew 8%, but you netted 11 <laughs> rental units. That's not awesome, right? And those are the kind of comparisons that have been really helpful to just let people um, see and talk about and, uh, and wonder why, right? When we get into the wondering why, then we say, oh, well, how do, how do short-term rentals play into this? How do, you know, how do all these other factors play in? It's been really great uh, conversation points. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip through some of this. Uh, so the survey data though, one of the things that's been good is we asked a lot about needs and attitudes. And so, um, what people say about their needs and then also, you know, kind of how they're feeling has been good too, because I think sometimes in a rural community too, if you only, you know, any community really, but an elected official is only as good as what they're hearing. And so this has been great for elected officials to say, this is a problem. It's not just the people that I have coffee with, right? This is a much broader conversation and an issue that the rest of our community is noticing. Um, let's see. So I'm going to skip through some of these, uh, just noting, you know, there's a lot of every, every small community wants young people, right? And just noting um, that renters, one of the ways that you can bring um, more young people to a community, right, is that you need housing for them. And rental housing is one of those pieces. There's been a lot of interest around 
uh, this data just around who renters are in our community and what they might need. Um, and also, anytime this comes up, right, people start to say like, oh, renters aren't in this conversation. <laughs> when you look around at who's on the town board, they all know each other. Everybody knows where they live. You know, they know where each other lives. Nobody's renting, right? Everybody has owned their house for 25 years. What they see as the housing issue is a little bit different. And so it's been a good basis to bring in some more conversation around equity. Um, also, when we asked renters how they saw the problem, right, they are way more likely to say um, in our communities that, um, that the community needed to address housing insecurity, right? So they're seeing this issue from a really different place. Those folks aren't in the room, right? We're gonna be missing, missing some important data. Um, this one has been really striking. I know there's been a few roads to Rome here to describe this, but you know, looking at what the median home price is in a community um, and the median household income and how those two numbers relate. Um, in our community, we see that they're out of whack, right? So if you can afford the median home price, you'd really need to be making a bit more. You'd need to be making about 64,000 uh, to be able to afford that median home price. Um, and hey, what do you know, in this first six months uh, of 2021, median home price went up even higher. So we see that that's an issue. We see that this feeling that people have of, it's just gotten really tight all the time. I don't remember someone, you know, getting multiple offers on their house. I don't remember that before in our community. Um, again, just sort of noting people's gut feeling has been really affirming in terms of uh, moving a conversation forward. The other piece that's of super interest in our community, and there was a lot of work to put in questions in these particular surveys um, of what do we think people will need? So when we look at a town of Iron River, you know, a thousand people um, living there, we, you know, how many people in that area are over 65, how many residents, um, when we ask them in the next five years, might think that they're gonna need some other kind of housing. That gives people really concrete numbers about their community. Oh my God, you know what? 250 people, 250 households in our little tiny community said they think they're gonna need something different. Where are they gonna go? Who are those folks? Um, what happens if they don't find a place to live? So uh, I think that, you know, even though, yeah, the survey data has been really helpful. It's also great that UW River Falls did it and we could trust it um, because <laughs> anytime you put out, you know, this is, this is a pretty strong survey. I think we had a couple thousand respondents. Um, it was census style, right? So we did that thing where you mail it out. It's coming, it's coming. Hey, it's here. Hey, I see you didn't fill it out yet. Will you fill it out? Uh, thank you for filling it out. Oh, you still didn't fill it out. Let me send you a new one, right? So it was that census style survey. So it's been really good to be able to share results in small communities that are about their communities that say, um, you can hang your hat on this, that this is what people in your community are feeling. Uh, this is aggregate data from both counties, but, you know, a lot of these, you know, there would be whatever, 83% of the people in your communities think that in the next five years, they're going to need someplace new to live. That's, a, that's alarming for most folks. And it, it, it's been a more interesting call to action. Um, also, we did a series of questions. You know, there's a lot of things when people don't want uh, affordable housing to be built, what they say. Um, and so, um, we ask people how they might feel about those things. And so that's been kind of instructional too, as we start to roll out these next phases, which is like, how do we address all this data? Um, I'm just gonna jump all the way to, ah, this WIDA pilot. I mentioned this before. Um, I feel like if you're in the world of extension, right? We, well, let me preface this. So this is this WIDA pilot. We put together our application to be this pilot community. WIDA has offered us a process um, that will, uh, which is around research and engagement, right? So we've got lots of research now to bring to the table that we can weed through uh, a variety of ideation sessions and some implementation over the next year or so is what it takes place. It's like a taste of your own medicine from extension, right? To see somebody else's process that, that you are like going to work through. Um, they pulled in a, a, a facilitation agency from Boston called Agency. They're great facilitators. It's a great process. I think that there's a lot of room for extension to do something like this I and mean, walk people through this same process, um, maybe a little bit more purposefully, maybe a little bit more hands on. I think that there's, I'm excited to get to the end to figure out how we might improve. Um, I think that there's some real options there. So uh, more on that when we get to the end of this. We are right like here, right? So we gathered insights, now we're coming back. Now we're, you know, it's this whole thing. Um, I love process diagrams and it's, it's great to be on the other end of those for a minute and <laughs> remind myself about what it is that not everybody loves about a process diagram. Um, yeah, so next steps, we're just looking at completing this process um, with WIDA, um, really working on 
these opportunities to, to, to collaborate across tribal and non-tribal government lines. When we went to get this big grant for housing study, um, guess what? We can't all, we can't all pull from the same funds. Um, when we talk about housing and we talk about, you know, this funding or that funding, uh, the, the tribal housing authorities have such a different set of acronyms that we're still trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. So there are some structural issues with really trying to collaborate. And that's been really disappointing and difficult to deal with. But I think we're starting to figure out maybe ways that we can work, um, you know, spots that are going to work really well across our area um, to work together and then spots where we have to kind of separate so that everyone can get what their, their needs met, um, like any good collaboration. Um, the other piece is that I, I'm loving that my partners are recognizing that um, we're going to need someone else to stand in this seat. Right, like this is not a seat that I can stand in forever. Um, and there's a great understanding of now the conversation isn't like, you know, do we need housing or you know who might be able to help. Now it's how do we get someone at the Economic Development Corporation? How do we get some building capacity with the Housing Authority? How do we get you know? So that has been wonderful to hear um, and, and understand that this will quickly grow. It, it already is growing out of my capacity to convene and also the expertise that we really need that's, that's, that has to be there, right? That isn't just someone volunteering and, and trying to do good works in the community. So um, I'm really appreciating that our community is really seeing this as, a, as an issue, but a lot of that has been good data. So I'm just going to rip through a list here of, I don't know, what time is it? How are we? What does that mean? Okay, I'm gonna go for it. You don't want me to? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so these are some things that I, I I feel like are yeses for extension. There's a couple of nos. Um, building a broad co coalition, um, and really helping them see what the benefits of collaboration are. Collaborating on the things that we want to, and then also knowing that there's some that we just have to let go of. You can't collaborate on everything, and um, that's been that's been a great learning through this process. Um, other dues. Um, just convening, the power of convening is huge. I think you all were talking about that, who's standing in the middle of that. That is one role that extension can play. Um, there's a lot around housing that needs advocacy too. And it's been great to be the convener and also help those folks that really wanna play that advocacy role, be armed with the right information, research, context, to be able to go do that advocacy at the state level um, uh, and, and keeping that separate. But really understanding what, what our lane is has been, has been pretty critical as we've been moving through. Because there's been times where I'm like, starting to feel like I'm advocating for this and I don't think that's really my job, you know? So, um, you know, making sure that we're in that education role. Um, solid data has been awesome. Um, I don't know, I, I applaud you all that can dig it up yourselves. <laughs> but I think just knowing where you get it and making sure that you're presenting it has been really helpful. It's been such a great jumping off uh, point. The other thing is contextualizing our research that we're providing our communities on this issue with appropriate examples. So it really doesn't help my county to share with them something that happened that was awesome in Madison. It just doesn't matter to be quite frank, right? There's a lot of those pieces that just don't translate. And so that's been a little bit of a struggle um, when we even try to compare what our data says with other places. So still building that up of who can we compare and how do we compare? Um, just looking at like all extension programs, right? Like this idea of building in your own obsolescence and building capacity. So uh, knowing that I can't stand in this particular connection forever, but who can and what organizations really need to build their capacity? You know, we want the housing authority to be much stronger than it is. How can we do that so that um, that this response is durable, right? So that there is continued um, process. Cause really housing is a long game, right? 10 years or more that we'll probably be at this to try and move the needle in any reasonable amount. Um, smaller wins. So we've been working on some of these larger pieces around you know, what can really affect this broader two county area, but there's a lot of smaller solutions. There's been a lot of co-ops that we've been sort of investigating on the side that are um, helpful because a nonprofit doesn't want to do all this, but they want to do one small piece. And so that's been exciting too. So there are some smaller wins and low hanging fruit that have been helpful, um, but knowing that we're going to need all of that probably to move the needle in any way. Um, again, working uh, housing into all of our economic development discussions. Uh, it just feels like a real win. I was also loving it. You all are here from the health perspective, right? We haven't done a lot of that working housing in from, from that piece, but, um, but that feels pretty important too, as we try to get that broader space. Um, housing work is equity work. I don't think I realized that going into this. And so, 
you know, just knowing that, right? When you have a conversation with the community, like we've been talking about today, like it, it disproportionately affects low and middle income folks. It just disproportionately affects, um, you know, uh, other other folks. So it's it's challenging, but that means that we have to be in that with and not for mindset. So that's been an important one too, is who's at the table when we talk about housing. It can't all just be uh, locally elected officials. Um, the systemic nature of housing, just recognizing that and making sure that we're educating in that direction um, so that people are seeing those connections. Uh, this one, there's just a couple of don'ts. Um, don't assume that all the housing tools from the urban environment will work in a rural region. I think that that's an important one as we look at what's happening in rural and how we need to be innovative and what we need to invent. Um, there's cues in what are happening in urban environments, but, but there's a lot of space for new. Um, don't underestimate NIMBYism, even in communities of high need. We've had some really stunning examples of what's coming out um, uh, of uh, even in communities that are reporting that they're really excited about housing, right? But it's insidious. And so um, it's really just keeps each time these, these examples of, of NIMBYism kind of pop out, we keep walking back to what does a community want? What does a community need? And, and how can we work to provide that? Um, and that's it. Yes, be quick. Tell me, I saw on one slide that there was something about the garage. Yeah, yeah. So we in our housing survey, one of the things that we wanted to do was, you know, if you know, if a if a if a developer came to your community tomorrow, because people are like, we can see developers in the community, no one's 